Yeah, apparently the uh, power went out today at the Novacare Complex, and uh, that moved some practice stuff around. They moved the practice back or they up were gonna, to 9 o'clock. They were going to do film in the morning and then practice in the afternoon. Ultimately, I believe what they had to do was that they practiced in the morning and did film in the afternoon. And instead of practicing at the Novacare Complex, they went over and used this thing called Lincoln Financial Field. John McMullen was there. He could give us the latest on that, plus on-field observations and uh, the latest on Jason Peters, who spoke today to reporters, including our John McMullen from 97.3 ESPN.com, who joins us now with our NFL news and notes. John, uh, the power went out, and, uh, yeah, Pete wants to know what Cowboy fan snuck in the building. <laughs> yeah, the best day, too, the hottest day of the year. So that's the time you don't want any air condition whatsoever. Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, <laughs> it was reminiscent of uh, Chip Kelly's press conferences with, like, the motorcade in the background, the birds chirping. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they didn't have a speaker. It was sort of uh, fly by the seat of your pants time. So <laughs> uh, it, it's one of those things you got to get through it. And the power was back on uh, by the time the locker room period was over, so. Uh, they're doing some construction at the Novacare complex, so maybe it was that. Maybe it was the, just the heat. Who knows? All right, uh, the heat gets to old guys, 35-year-old Jason Peters, who was not at the voluntary work, but he was there. Uh, and he said some interesting things today about his future in Philadelphia. Yeah, he, he uh, wants a new contract, and obviously he is under contract through this season and next season. But the guaranteed money is up. So basically, uh, as we understand what the NFL is, it's a year-by-year -year proposition. If you remember back early this offseason, uh, the stories broke that the Eagles were asking Jason to take a pay cut. He said no, which is his right. The Eagles made their decision to move forward and still wanted him to be a part of the team. But he wants uh, sort of more clarity to a situation. He doesn't want to be going through this uh, again next season. So uh, he would like a, sort of a rework deal that would guarantee he could finish his career in Philadelphia. We'll see how that works out. But he did also say he doesn't plan uh, to hold out uh, in training camp or anything of that nature. So right now it's behind the scenes with Howie Roseman, and uh, we'll see uh, if the Eagles do indeed want Jason Peters through 2018. John, do you think that he can still play at a high level, like a Pro Bowl level? Oh, yeah, he played at a Pro Bowl. He made the Pro Bowl last year, uh, and he was – one of the better left tackles in football, I, I would say. You know, I, I think people in the NFC East are a little spoiled and don't realize uh, how bad some of the left tackles are around the league. Because you, if you look in this division, you have Trent Williams in Washington, who might be the best left tackle in football. You have Teron Smith, uh, who might be the second best left tackle in Dallas. And you have Jason Peters, who's still in the top five at 35 years old. So the fact that he's the third best left tackle in the division may not sound that great until you start looking outside the division. And he is still a very good player, uh, and you can tell that by how his peers, Lane Johnson specifically, almost speaks in reverence of him. Uh, he has so much respect for him. So he still plays at a high level, uh, and it's going to be very, very difficult to replace him when he is gone. Two-parter for you here, John. How many years do you think that he has left, and do the Eagles want to move Lane Johnson over to left, left tackle at some point? Uh, many think that that's what he was drafted to be, a left tackle. Yeah, he was drafted to be a left tackle. He played left tackle at Oklahoma. That's what everyone projected him as, uh, and the Eagles ultimately projected him as, and they've been saying that since he was drafted. When and if Jason Peters ever does retire – Lane Johnson will be the left tackle. That's still the plan. Uh, they did it. Uh, they sort of got some of the rust off Lane from playing right tackle for so long. When Jason was gone during the OTAs, they they allowed Lane to take all the first team reps at left tackle. So that is still this team's ultimate plan uh, for when Jason Peters is gone. They're going to flip 
uh, Lane Johnson over to the left side, and hopefully Big V uh, will be able to stand up and hold up on the right side. John McMullen's with us, 97.3 ESPN.com. I, I did read the transcript today of uh, – I, I could have sworn I heard uh, Doug Peterson kind of indicate – that they're going to give Isaac Sayamala, that they want him to get, you know, uh, with the starter reps, right? So it's going to be Sayamala and Peters on that left side together. But uh, it doesn't sound as if there's a lot of competition at left guard. It sounds like they have their mind made up already. Well, it's interesting. I, I don't think they have their mind made up. Their mind is they want Isaac Sayamala to win the job, and they're giving him every opportunity to win the job. Uh, but they understand if he doesn't play well, if he doesn't perform well, Alan Barber can step in and play at a high level. In fact, it's interesting. Doug compared Alan Barber to Jason Peters and, and basically said, we know what Alan Barber can do. We don't have to look at Alan Barber. We understand what he brings to the table. Said a similar thing about Jason Peters. Uh, and that's where you have to learn where Isaac Sayamalo is. But while they say that, this has been for the past few practices that we were able to observe in the OTAs. And again, today, Sayamalo always gets the first rep with the starters at left guard, uh, but he's splitting them with Alan Barber, who was also getting a lot of looks with the first team. So uh, sometimes they say one thing and, and think another, but there's, there's no doubt the preference for this team would be, for Sayamalu to start at left guard and for Barber to be the game day swing tackle and the backup for both Jason Peters and, and, and Lane Johnson uh, on the 46-man roster on, on game days. Uh, yeah, John, uh, and as you've mentioned many a times, uh, you've seen now this group out there through OTAs and then you get minicamp today. It seems that there's, if not a lot of competition, a lot of depth at that offensive line where last year – you know, five different right tackles, moving guys. I mean, say Amala played three different positions. It seems that they made a conscious effort to make sure that they had, you know, NFL-level guys at every position. Yeah, they really did. It's it's definitely the deepest part of their team uh, when you look at the offensive line, specifically, uh, specifically on the interior, uh, where they just have a whole host of guys that can play and at least equip themselves pretty well at, at the NFL level. I'm not going to say guys like Wisniewski and, and Warmack are going to go in and play at a Pro Bowl level, but they can at least play, and they're not going to embarrass themselves. And when you look around again, the rest of the league, a lot of, not, uh, a lot of teams don't have that kind of luxury. So the Eagles have done a very, very good job of building up the depth on the offensive line. And part of it is directly related to what happened last year because they went through so many issues because of lane suspension and then all the injuries piling up after that. Hey, John, uh, Trey Burton, uh, I'm interested to get uh, the tight end. You know, how do you see the tight end three guys uh, getting, you know, their playing time this year? You know, he's kind of been a jack-of-all-trades guy, and, you know, uh, they use him in a lot of different roles. Uh, do you envision – do they envision him having a bigger presence in the offense, or do they want to see Zach Ertz maybe get more playing time than he has in the past? Well, I, I, I mean, Zach is – it, it, it's always I, I don't know where the disconnect is with Zach Ertz to tell you the truth because he put up some pretty big numbers last year and I don't know how much bigger you can expect a tight end uh, to go uh, as far as producing number of catches and things like that uh, so I think they're fine with Zach Ertz the concern is uh, as Brett Selleck ages and, and what Trey Burton is as a player uh there's not a lot of blocking in that group. And at some point, <laughs> you need somebody to block. We've talked, I wrote, I just posted a story on, on 973ESPN.com about the way they've been utilizing Darren Sproles and Donnell Pumphrey on the field at the same time. You know, when you think about that and Ertz being on the field, who's not a very good blocker, and you say to yourself, at some point, somebody's got to block somebody. So I think that's the issue they have with the tight end position because 
the one guy who can block, and that's Selleck, is a descending player, uh, and they really haven't gotten a replacement for him. And some guy, John, asked about the pony fo- formation and the running backs. Uh, what did uh, Doug Peterson have to say about the running backs and some of the formations that he's been using them in so far? Yeah, and that's what they've been doing. And, and I asked Doug about that specifically because they've been using this uh, 21P formation, which is two running backs, and they call it the pony formation, which is when Darren and, and Danelle Pumphrey are on the field at the same time. And generally – when that happens, Darren's in the backfield as the running back, and, and Pumphrey splits wide, either in the slot or, or even outside the numbers as a wide receiver. It, it's, it, you know, you wonder if it's something they're working on uh, just in the spring and, and sort of shaking it out, because that's what you do in the spring. You, you try things out, and maybe they don't work, but it's pretty clear they like Danelle Pumphrey. Obviously, they love Darren Sproles as they should, and they want to find get they want to find ways to get these guys on the field. It remains to be seen if they can do it. I know it must have been hot today. I was trying to get a laugh at you. I knew it was you that asked that question. I just I didn't realize how hot it was outside. <laughs> it's too hot. It's too hot to laugh. Pete. You know that. Was there any uh, clarity, John, on the Jeremy Macklin situation? Macklin signs with. Baltimore yesterday. Did Doug clear that up? Because there was a lot of social media back and forth yesterday over, hey, what's the deal? You said you didn't have interest in this guy. Yeah, he did clear it up, and he did admit they revisited it, and they did have interest. So uh, give a star, gold star to Josina Anderson, who broke that story. You know, it's interesting. I I think, and I'm going to write about this sometime this week, I I think that's a, a very bad thing for Jordan Matthews. I think it is a clear, clear signal that this team no longer is very high on Jordan Matthews. They're obviously looking at different receivers. They're looking in different directions. This is probably going to be uh, his last season with the Philadelphia Eagles. And I'll tell you, and I know people are going to snicker, and I'm going to hear it on Twitter, if Nelson Aguilar continues to play at the way he, he's playing in OTAs, and we all understand, put all the caveats on it, there's no pads, there's no contact, there's no pressure. Uh, but if he continues to show up the way he has, he's going to push Jordan Matthews for playing time. Yeah, uh, the, the, I wrote the piece about uh, Nelson Aguilar asking whether or not his career can be salvaged. And, John, we remember – you know, you've covered the NFL for a long time. It was the third year that receivers really, you know, now, that being said, they had better years than his first two. But, you know, he got hurt the first year, and last year I think uh, he had, the, you know, the the, the um, uh, confidence issues like that. I'm not making excuses for him because, quite frankly, I think he's been a bust uh, and, and been uh, not very good. But – I guess there are some signs, and that that third year, and remember, he came out of college early, too, so he's a younger guy, but uh, this is it for him, right? Yeah, it's it, and and nobody's trying to deflect from the fact that you're right, Mike. His first two seasons were disasters. There's no defending them. He he was awful. Um, But what he does, at least on the field, at least his skill set, he's far more versatile. Uh, and then Jordan Matthews, he can play inside. He can play outside. That's the concern with the Eagles with Jordan Matthews, this particular coaching staff. They don't want – guys, if you think about what Chip Kelly did, Chip Kelly was all about tempo. And everybody lined up in the same spot every time because it was about getting the playoff within 13 seconds or less. So there wasn't this – multi-formation that Doug Peterson likes to do. We just talked about the pony formation, 21. It could be 11 personnel, 12, 13 personnel, 21, 22. All these different types of formations. They don't want receivers who only play the X spot, the Z spot, the slot spot. They want guys that can move around so they can take advantage uh, of opposing defenses on any particular week. They've, They've sort of looked at Jordan Matthews and said he's just a slot guy. They want receivers that can move around, and that's the slight opening Nelson Aguilar has. I'm not saying the door is ajar, but it's not locked, 
And who knows? Maybe he kicks it down. John McBone with us. The mandatory minicamp day number one is in the books. And John, I saw a tweet that uh, Carson went through out this morning. Minicamp, let's roll and attack the day and the defense. And then he throws in Jordan Hicks, Malcolm Jenkins, Fletcher Cox, and Rodney McLeod. And Malcolm Jenkins tweets back and says, well, that didn't go very well. You got to watch the entire practice, John. Who won the day? Well, the defense has been winning most of the days. I, I think actually Carson was better today than he has been for most of the uh, the pr- practices that have been open. Uh, but, yeah, I, and that generally is the way the NFL goes. The defense is usually ahead of the offense early, and, and that continued today. Uh, but they're getting – remember how much change there's been at, at the receiver position specifically. So – you're still developing that chemistry uh, between Carson Wentz and Alshon Jeffrey, Torrey Smith, uh, and that's all a work in progress. So it's understandable uh, that they've been a little bit behind. But I'll tell you, who sh- Jeffrey showed up big today. He's He is just you, – you haven't seen a rec- receiver like that in Philadelphia for a very long time. And even if you go back to Deshaun Jackson, Jeremy Macklin – uh, players like that. He's got so much more size. He's a different type of receiver, uh, and it's just going to be very impactful uh, on the Eagles' offense. Does it say something about Carson's leadership, maturity, playfulness, that he's going to take a swipe at these guys via Twitter in the morning? Uh, he never would have done this last year at this time, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, last year at this time, he was the third string quarterback. So, you know, he was just, he just kept his mouth shut and, and tried to do his work. I mean, this was Sam's team and, and Chase Daniel was here. He was uh, just, uh, obviously, he was a big deal because he was the second overall pick. But uh, as far as his standing on the team, uh, he certainly wasn't looked at as a leader or, or projected to be a leader. So it's just an entirely different circumstance. And, yeah, I, I mean, when it's 96 degrees out, you better be having some fun. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. Hey, I haven't heard anything at all about Corey Clement. Uh, anybody seen him? Has he uh, looked like a guy who's now got no no possibility of making – I mean, when they brought him in before the Garrett Blunt, yeah, he looks like he's got a shot. Any shot now? No, I, I don't think he has any shot at, at the 53. I, I think he's got a good chance to be on the practice squad. But, yeah, I mean, that was part of it. Uh, when they did sign him, LeGarrette wasn't here. Uh, LeGarrette is here now. He's the starting running back. And from there, you sort of do uh, – uh, you look at the numbers, and they're not good for Corey Clement because you do have Darren Sproles. You do have Denell Pumphrey. You do have uh, Wendell Smallwood, who are – all ahead of them, uh, and you're not going to keep five running backs. So, barring injury, uh, yeah, he's he's not going to make the 53, but I, I would be stunned if he didn't make the practice squad. Uh, you do, uh, Doug Peterson, that is, by the way, uh, spoke today, and uh, he did talk about uh, a couple guys in the secondary, one uh, being uh, obviously uh, uh, Jalen Mills, uh, who you mentioned the other day, maybe the best guy in their secondary. He also talked about Sidney Jones, who's back now. And uh, I guess, you know, we talked a little bit about Sidney Jones the other day, but I guess it's good uh, that he's out there and getting a chance to at least be around. And at least um, you get a chance to see that uh, he's not in a boot. And he's not completely, um, you know, the ability, you know, just out. You, you see some of these guys and you watch. I remember when, like, Sam Bradford was around. You see him, like, limping around, and people were like, I don't even know if he's going to get to training camp. Not saying that Sidney Jones is going to get to training camp, but at least you get a chance to see uh, how the kid looks like. Yeah, and, you know, right, he was a very serious injury that went, happened time. in March. So, uh, obviously, no one's expecting him to be on the field anytime soon, but it was really, really important uh, to get him in South Philadelphia just for the mental aspect of it and, and that goofy NFL rule where certain guys from certain colleges can't be there for OTAs. He was one of them. Uh, so from that standpoint, the Eagles' defensive coaches are just thrilled that they have him in the room and they don't have to worry about FaceTime and things like that to, to communicate with him. 
Yep, and uh, Rasul Douglas uh, obviously out there as well. Uh, there was a question about uh, a sequence where Wentz beat him and then Douglas came back and broke up the pass. It seems that Douglas has a real knack of being around the ball and breaking passes up in his young tenure. Yeah, he does. I, I mean, that's the thing you like about Rasul Douglas, and I talked to him uh, about that in the locker room after the practice because he did get beat, and he got beat deep by Marcus Johnson. And you say, who? Marcus Johnson, uh, who's, you know, uh, of the second-tier Eagles receivers, he's probably the fastest. He might have the biggest upside. Uh, but still, when you're when one of your top cornerbacks or projected top cornerbacks is getting his door doors blown off by a, a third string receiver it, it's a concern but a couple plays later Douglas just shrugged it off and broke up a pass and that's what Doug talked about and, and Rasul himself talked about is the guy competes and he's got the one thing all good cornerbacks need in this league is a short memory so we didn't uh, put his head down when he got beat. He, he just went back to work, and that's that's a good sign. All right. Uh, Sports Bash Live 97.3 ESPN. John McMullen with our NFL news and notes. Eagles continue minicamp tomorrow. Doug Peterson back at the podium tomorrow morning. So we'll have the news and notes for you here on the Sports Bash. Thanks, John. Hey, thank you, guys.